So thanks for coming. Um, <clears throat> we'll get right into it. For two months out of every summer from zero to 16 years of age, I lived in this cabin. It's about 20 by 15 feet, no TV, no telephone. Closest neighbors were several miles away. Our driveway was a quarter mile dirt track off of a secluded dirt road, off of a secluded paved road in secluded Vermont. <sighs> I really got in touch with myself because, you know, I'm an only child. And so I got to know my own mind and my own relationship to everything around me. And so <clears throat> I had this experience. I didn't know what it meant back then, but I know what it means now. At about five or six years old, I was playing in the front of the cabin, and the wind was blowing through the pine trees. And it was making that beautiful sound that wind makes when it blows through pine trees. And in one unforgettable moment, I knew with my entire being and all of my consciousness that I was a part of what I was looking at, and it was a part of me. There was no separation. For all intents and purposes, I had a transcendental spiritual experience. And I think that children spontaneously seek out these spiritual experiences without actually knowing what they're seeking out. So the research shows us that when children are given the choice between playing in a wooded area or playing in an urban landscape, they almost always pick that green area. And then it also shows us that their play is more creative in a wooded area compared to an urban landscape. This is Rabbi Joshua Heschel. I don't know how many famous rabbis you guys know, but uh, this is the only one I know. Joshua Heschel is really well-known 60s and 70s, and he was actually asked by uh, Martin Luther King to join the Civil Rights Movement. And in return, he asked King to join him in the anti-war movement. And he actually spoke at King's funeral. He was quoted in a book called Last Child in the Woods, uh, and his quote goes like this. Our goal should be to live life in radical amazement. Everything is phenomenal. Everything is incredible. To be spiritual is to be constantly amazed. And we are constantly amazed when we look at these certain patterns in nature. This is the vegetable Romanesco. And Romanesco has this beautiful pattern at the tip of each point. And any mathematician should be able to tell you that each point of Romanesco ends in a perfect Fibonacci sequence. Now, Fibonacci was this mathematician who developed this sequence in 1202, a really long time ago, to try and explain these patterns in nature that we see all around us. And the sequence goes as follows. It starts off with 0 and 1, and then each subsequent number is a sum of the previous two numbers. So, one, it's 0 plus 1 is 1, 1 plus 1 is 2, 2 plus 1 is 3, and so on. And if you put that to scale, in cubes, and you draw an arc from the smallest to the largest, you get this pattern, which we recognize all over, maybe a nautilus shell, maybe all of these other things that we see in nature. But not everything is patterned like this, right? There's a reason, in my opinion, my theory is that there's a reason that we just don't have everything patterned like this in nature. My theory is that because there are things that are unstructured, it provides us that inherent knowledge in programming this sort of thing provides us with this sort of muse, kind of provides inspiration for us to create all these new amazing things. And when we watch children play in nature, we see that the beauty of it is that it's, it's unstructured time and that there are parts of it that's structured, but there's parts that really are unstructured. And the mind of a child really resonates with that experience. When they go out in nature, they love it because it's kind of open-ended time. Take, for instance, my friend Oren here. So, uh, the son of a close friend of mine. Now, uh, Oren has a soccer outfit on. There's a soccer ball on the field. There's other kids with soccer outfits on the field, and he's playing, and the other kids are playing. Are they playing soccer? It's sort of. Much to the parents' chagrin, 
just playing, and all the parents are like, come on, kick the ball, man, kick right into the net. That's how you, that's how you play. Why aren't they playing correctly? I'd... And all the kids are like, what are you talking about? Like, we're totally playing. This is playing. Why don't you guys know what playing is? Children know just inherently that play is an autotelic action. Now, autotelic means that something has a purpose or a benefit in and not a part of itself. In other words, play, for the purpose of play, is the purpose of play. <clears throat> when you bring a child out in nature, they create certain things out of the existing structure that's already there. <clears throat> Take, for instance, me at five or six years old in front of the cabin. Just so you know, Vermont's a landlocked state, in case you didn't know that. And the closest body of water is a stream a few miles away, about two inches deep. But that day, I had my scuba mask on, my life preserver, my flippers. And that day, I was Jacques Cousteau exploring the ocean. That's what happens to a child when you leave him alone in the woods for two months every summer. <laughs> now... Children love dress up, and you see these behaviors in all children, but you also see a few similarities, personality characteristics that artists or inventors or people who, you know, created patents under their name, they have these qualities that they also had when they were a child. All children have this kind of inconsistency to their thoughts, and all people who are artists or inventors have an inconsistency to their thoughts. The filters are left out. All of their thoughts are non-literal. So is this a remote that helps me progress through this talk? Or is this a rocket ship? Or maybe something to throw at something else? I mean, I don't know. And their thoughts are always unconventional or unusual. We see this, these similarities between all children and inventors or artists or people who are considered creative. <clears throat> but as we grow up, we try to do this. We try to dress up whenever we'd like. It just... It looks weird, right? It's <laughs> uncomfortable to everybody. You know, you're on the bus and there's one open seat next to you. And you're like, oh, I know this guy's going to sit next to me and I really don't want to talk to him. And it just is uncomfortable. When children, we try to kind of train children out of this experience as they grow older. So this child, because he's not paying attention to what's going on, if he's doing this in class, he now has a certain condition and we try to drug those kids out of this behavior, but what's he, he doing? I mean, nature's fascinating. He's looking out the window. He's wondering, like, how did that squirrel jump from one branch to the other? Or why does that particular tree look like all their leaves are upside down when it's about to rain? And it's because of the wind and how the wind patterns go. And it's teaching him something so much more important maybe than some of the other things that are going on in the classroom. We see that in communities that have less opportunities for children to play in green areas, we know that the juvenile delinquency rate is higher in those communities. And if those kids move on, they continue on to become career criminals, we put them here and we remove them even further away from nature. We disconnect them even more. But even if you are a prisoner, nature can still affect you. There's a study in a Michigan prison that showed us that the prisoners who had cell windows that faced forests or farmland versus a prisoner that had a window that faced the interior courtyard, they visited the infirmary less, they were sick less, and they were less violent. And I see a lot of similarities between the prison system and the healthcare system, right? This is a hospital hallway. But the same thing plays out here as well. We see that post-operative patients who are in a room with a window after their operation that faces forest or farmland, their discharge times from the hospital are quicker, and they use less painkillers, versus somebody who has a post-op room that faces something like this. What happens? It's as if something inside you knows that this is not your source. This isn't where you came from. This isn't inspiring. This isn't what inspires your body to heal up so it can get back out to that. It's as if something inside you gets really <laughs> depressed and despondent, you know, and like grumpy cat, you know, you just, what's the use looking at a brick wall? 
Now, if we look at a prehistoric example of depression, we see sort of the same thing. Uh, the great white shark has not evolved for millions and millions of years. It's still essentially a dinosaur. And we see this really fascinating behavior. Humans just can't seem to keep great white sharks um, in captivity. The longest that we've been able to keep a great white shark in captivity is 198 days. At 198 days, this shark, in perfect salinated, huge tank, feeding huge amounts of fish heads every day, starts spinning in circles and stops eating. It essentially becomes depressed. It says, I'm no longer connected to my natural environment. I'm, what's the use? And 198 days is the longest. We're not even talking about those that stopped eating and spun in circles after 30 days or 40 days. <clears throat> and there are so many opportunities for children to be removed from nature. We're so much more adaptable, but there's so many sexy technological distractions that really pull us away from our own inherent abilities. For instance, this guy at a coffee shop that I work at all the time is a fully functioning laptop toy and a fully functioning mouse. Now, if your distractions are taken away, we can do these really amazing things. So many of you might have seen Ben Underwood as a teenager, if he was on Oprah a few years ago. Ben Underwood, as a child, lost both of his eyes to cancer. He developed this really amazing uh, technique called echolocation, just like dolphins. So he would and bounce these sounds off of wherever he was. And he mastered it to the point where he could shoot a basketball, he could play foosball, he can uh, determine whether or not a large object in front of him was a recycling bin or a car, he could play foosball. And <clears throat> he didn't survive past 16, which is really sad, his cancer came back. But he left us with this amazing legacy, which is that if our distractions are removed, we are capable of these kind of what seems to be supernatural sort of things. And this is what happens when you get out in nature, when you quiet everything. All of your senses become hyper acute and intense. You can hear a mouse rustling under the leaves or one bird jumping to another branch. I mean, everything is super sensitive. But as we grow older, we just, we get in these <laughs> more and more difficult situations, right? We, we remove ourselves from nature even more in the pursuit of something. I don't know what that is, but we see that workers who work in windowless offices have this really fascinating behavior without being encouraged one way or the other. We see that <clears throat> if workers in windowless offices are given a choice between a nature poster and a cityscape poster, we see that six times more often, they choose the nature posters over the cityscape posters. And in another study, we saw that people who had nature posters in their windowless office, compared to no decorations or cityscape posters, their stress was much lower when working on creative tasks. <clears throat> I wonder whether or not if we produced millions and millions of really cheap nature posters and we gave it to every prisoner in every prison in the country, would we see health improve in the prison system, reducing costs for that, and violence decrease? And the science shows us that that should work like that. <clears throat> or how about this classroom in Taiwan where they looked at, um, researchers looked at the behavior and the health of the students and the teachers in this classroom for a whole semester over, yeah, <laughs> we're gonna get to the music talk next, um, compared to this classroom, and uh, there were six, they put six big plants in the back of the classroom, and what they found is that both the students and the teachers had lower sick days than the room that didn't have the plants, and delinquency rates were much lower in the room with the plants. We see that kids with actual ADD or ADHD, when they play in a greener play area compared to walking around a city block for only 20 minutes, their ADD symptoms decrease and the cityscape, city block, 20 minute walk doesn't do anything to their symptoms. It's as if they go outside and they press this big fat reset button. And that reset button has been, it's been defined and it's called the attention restoration theory. The attention restoration theory is the, it says that the fatigue from maintained voluntary attention 
can be renewed by contact with nature. And we see it, we've already talked about it in the research. It's like this scene. For some of you who have seen Ferris Bueller's Day Off, all the students were trying to like pay attention to Ben Stein's boring economics teacher character, and they were falling asleep. This is fatiguing, but what happens when you guys look at this? What happens? Look at that picture and just look at it. What does your mind, what does it do? Shh. What? <laughs> what does your mind do? It does nothing. Nothing. Because... <laughs> It arrests your mind. It stops you from thinking. It forces you to rest and do nothing. And that's an amazing, great thing. We see that this has population-wide effects. The University of Glasgow looked at population effects of being in a green area in parts of England. So the health disparities, they looked at health disparities between the rich and the poor, which mean that the rich are always richer than the poor in virtually every country everywhere around the world. It's a very predictable pattern. They found... It really is. I think you're laughing because that's obvious, but it's not obvious to everybody. Um, <clears throat> they found that in the greenest parts of England, the health disparities between the rich and the poor were decreased by 50, 5-0%, decreased by half. The biggest effects were on cardiovascular disease. Now, if we look at some of the research on cardiovascular disease or the effects of coming in direct contact with nature, we find something really fascinating that's directly linked to cardiovascular disease. This study, they used earthing or grounding pads, which is like an electric blanket, but it's not plugged into the wall. The wire from this blanket, it goes underneath the bed sheet, and the wire goes out the window and sticks into the ground. That's it. And the people who are sleeping on a grounding pad for a few months, compared to those who are not, had lower blood viscosity, which means that their blood was thinner. You have thin blood, your cardiovascular disease risk is lower. There's the science backing up all of the benefits, all of the long-lasting life effects of being in contact with nature. <clears throat> and we see a very fascinating pattern in certain countries. We see the top three longest living populations, Monaco, Macau, which is in Japan, uh, excuse me, which is in China, and Japan. Monaco, strange animal. Highest GDP in the world, lowest unemployment rate, perfect example of, of wealth buying health. But let's look at China. China has these gardens all over the place, and uh, their gardens are steeped in this concept of Taoism that speaks of the five mountainous islands that are inhabited by the eight immortals that lived in perfect harmony with nature. And the Japanese gardens are based in Shintoism, which speaks of the fundamental connection between the power and the beauty of the land of Japan and the people of Japan. <coughs> and in a Japanese study, looking at something called Shinrin-yoku, which translates into forest bathing. You walk into the forest, you look at the trees, you listen to the sounds, you smell the smells, and you touch the plants. Only 20 minutes showed us lower salivary cortisol levels, which is a measure of stress, versus somebody who did a 20-minute walk, again, around a city block. <clears throat> and when we're at the end of our lives, when our brains are deteriorating, like in Alzheimer's disease, Alzheimer's patients who got to look at tropical fish aquariums for any intermittent time in the day, compared to those who were not able to do that, had better feeding habits, lower agitation rates, and better social interaction. And if we look at actually touching nature, we see that doing just daily gardening, not cardiovascular workouts, daily gardening in old age will decrease your dementia risk by 36%. And then when we look at Alzheimer's patients who got to do daily gardening, we see again the same thing as the fish study, lower agitation rates, better social interaction, better feeding. But the most beautiful thing between the tropical fish study and the daily gardening study was that both groups, when compared to those who weren't in contact with nature, had less wandering, which is a big problem in Alzheimer's. It is as if when you come in contact with nature, nature tells you something inside and says, it's okay. You're already home. There's nowhere to go. Just relax. And it brings me back to the Fibonacci sequence in my mind where in the beginning, we are children, we are creative, 
we're happy, and then we learn more, and we spin out, and we do more, and we make more money, but we don't necessarily become happier. Only when we tap back into that source do we really feel like we're fully living. And so in closing, you can get the benefits from nature a number of ways. You can look at it, you can smell the smells, you can listen to the sounds, and you can touch it specifically. So please, don't lose that child that still exists within you because that is your source of vitality and inspiration and creativity. Thank you very much. <laughs>